Okay, Nevenger, happy Monday, and we are back with another reading from Artists and Their Pets. I think we'll probably finish this book this week. Um, decided not to do a green screen today just to lessen the stress on myself. Um, I've been over fancifying my videos, but um, I'll still do the little boop boxes up here. Um, but it's just so nice. I'm doing my reading outside again today and hopefully working most of the day out here too. Today we are reading about Vasily Kandinsky and it says, from Russia with color. So guess what? He's Russian. All right, and here we have a nice illustration of uh, Kandinsky and you'll notice some things about it perhaps and maybe in the words you'll put the context clues together. Love of color, music, horses, and cats. Vasily Kandinsky painted one of the first abstract paintings. He painted with bold colors, played harmonious music, and kept pet cats. Lover of color, music, horses, and cats. I didn't know he was a lover of horses, but that makes sense because of one of his paintings, um, which I'm imagining will be in here. Um, but yes, he was a lover of music. So we see the music notes and then the kitty cat there and some of uh, the kind of mock-ups of his artwork. A pioneer of abstract art, Vasily Kandinsky explored the effects of color through paint. He was a leader of new ideas and his art changed from figurative paintings of things that we all recognize from the real world to abstract paintings that expressed his own symbolism and ideas with music. His art inspired many younger artists who came after him. Kandinsky was born in 1866 in Moscow to well-educated upper-class parents of mixed backgrounds, including Russian, Mongolian, and German. Most of his childhood was spent in the cosmopolitan city of Odessa. Noticing his son's gifts with music and art, his father enrolled him in a private class for drawing, piano, and cello. While in Italy with his family as a child, he was inspired by the architecture of Venice and Rome. In 1889, while studying law and economics at the University of Moscow, Kandinsky was selected as part of a group to study people in the Vologda district in northwestern Russia. He became fascinated by their folk art and the ways they decorated their houses. Those shapes and colors inspired him later. In 1893, he accepted a position on the university's law faculty to teach law. Okay, I just learned so much about Kandinsky I didn't know. Um, and Russia, I guess. I don't know what the Logda um, district is, and I am automatically fascinated if it has anything to look like um, Kandinsky's paintings, which are just bright colors and shapes and designs and patterns. Because um, if there's houses painted like that, sign me up. <laughs> um, and I didn't know he taught law. Kandinsky had a condition called synesthesia. Synes synesthesia. This meant that he saw colors in his mind when he heard music and other sounds. So despite being happy teaching law, he was always interested in color and art. In 1896, he left his job and went to Germany to the art school of Anton Asby in Munich for two years. He studied under Franz von Stuck, at the Munich Academy of Fine Arts in 1900. Synesthesia. So he, he would hear a sound, even like a musical note, and to him that would always make him think of a certain color. So different notes would be a different color, like A sharp might be red, B flat, I don't know anything about music notes, so I assume those are notes. B flat could be a country blue, and um, you know, so on. So almost like when he would hear a symphony playing, he would see colors dancing around. So he was able to take what he would see from what he heard and put that visually onto a canvas. So I think that's really cool. I wish I had that. Anyway. Kandinsky loved cats, especially an orange tabby named Vashki, which means wash in Norwegian. <clears throat> in 1901, with three other artists, Kandinsky started Phalanx, Phalan, Phalanx, Phalanx, a modern artists association that expanded to include an exhibitions group and art school. While teaching at the Phalanx school, 
he befriended a student, Gabriel Munter, who became his companion for the next 15 years. From 1903 to 1909, he and Gabriel traveled around Europe and to Northern Africa. The colors and light inspired them both. In Dresden, Germany, in 1905, artists including Emily Nold, Ernest Ludwig Kirchner, Fritz Bleil, and Karl Schmidt Rutloff formed a group they called Die Brücke, the bridge, suggesting a bridge between art of the past and art of the future. They painted to express their negative feelings and about the materialistic society they were living in. The art was direct and simplified, with distorted colors and jarring shapes, and it intrigued Kandinsky. Kandinsky and his friend Franz Marc formed a group with several, uh, seven other artists in 1911. They called it, can you guess, we've said this one a few times now in this book, I think they have a preference. It was called Der Blaue Reiter, or the Blue Rider. Probably because Kandinsky and Mark loved horses and also considered the color blue to be spiritual. They all used bold, unexpected colors and shapes to express their emotions, and they held three exhibitions and published a manual called the Blue Rider Almanac. You can see the picture here, so I'll try to find an image of that, but it's, uh, it says Blaue Reiter, um, German for blue, Reiter for rider, a little blue horse and a person on it. <clears throat> The almanac included contemporary, primitive, and folk art, all things that were influencing Kandinsky's art at the time. Kandinsky also published an essay concerning the spiritual in art, explaining his belief that art should project spiritual ideas through line, color, and composition. So for him, art making was a spiritual experience. Kit Kat. Kandinsky was producing paintings that blended abstraction with the real world and were also spiritual. He gave many of them musical titles such as composition, harmony, and improvisation. When Germany declared war on Russia in 1914, World War I broke out. It meant that all Russians in Germany had to leave, so Kandinsky returned to Russia. When Franz Marc was killed in combat, Der Blaue Reiter ended. <clears throat> Before returning to Moscow, Kandinsky and Gabriel Munter traveled to Switzerland and Sweden, but their friendship ended. Lost my place. Sorry. Traveled to Switzerland, but their relationship ended. He soon met and married Nina Andriskaya. Andri Nina Andriskaya. We'll just call her Nina. <laughs> the daughter of a Tsarist colonel. Back in Russia, he discovered the work of the Russian constructivist and suprematist. In 1921, oh, here's a little picture of Nina. Actually looks like um, Michael's Aunt Nina. <laughs> in 1921, the architect Walter Gruppius invited Kandinsky back to Germany to teach at the Bauhaus. <laughs> um, we've heard about the Bauhaus before too, which was an innovative art, architecture, and design school. He and Nina moved to Berlin, gaining German citizenship in 1928. Kandinsky taught his students his deep beliefs about art, including color theories and spiritualism in painting. I can feel the power. <laughs> Reflecting the groundbreaking developments and designs being made in the Bauhaus, as well as modernism that was developing across the world while Kandinsky was teaching at the Bauhaus, his paintings became more geometric, featuring circles, semicircles, straight lines, squares, and triangles. At the Bauhaus, the teachers all lived in specially built modernist style houses near the school. Kandinsky and Nina were neighbors with the Swiss painter Paul Clay and his wife Lily, and some years later Nina wrote a book called Kandinsky and I. In it she told how the Kandinskys and the Clays could see each other's cats in the window of their Bauhaus Houses. With their Bauhaus houses. This is a little picture of the cats. Meow. Meow, meow. Kandinsky was given his first solo exhibition in New York in 1923 by the Society Anomaly, an American art organization that sponsored lectures, concerts, publications, and exhibitions of modern art. 
Kandinsky was still teaching at the Bauhaus then, and in 1924, he and Clay, Alexei von Jalinsky, and Lionel Feininger started a group to follow Der Blaue Reiter, which they called the Blaue Fear. 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 The Blaue Fear. I had to count in German because uh, it's blue four, the number four. Blaue. Blue. Fear. Four. Eins, zwei, drei, vier. Their painting styles were all different, but they set up the group in order to exhibit together, and they organized exhibitions of their work in Germany, America, and Mexico between 1925 and 1934. Kandinsky's first one-man Parisian exhibition was held in 1920 year, and that year he also traveled to Belgium and the French Riviera. Another exhibition of his work was held in Paris in 1930. In 1931, Kandinsky created wall decorations for an architectural exhibition in Berlin. The Bauhaus and Kandinsky had moved to Dessau. Meanwhile, the Nazis were rising in power, and in 1933, they closed the Bauhaus. So, Kandinsky and Nina moved back to Berlin. All this back and forth. His work at the time featured pictures, signs, symbols, and softer color and it came to be called his romantic or concrete period. But 57 of his paintings were confiscated by the Nazis and labeled degenerate art. Try and do that now, I dare you. Eventually the Kandinsky settled in um, Neuilly sur Seine near Paris. He began blending ideas, creating curving, richly colored, slightly humorous paintings that contrast with his geometric Bauhaus period. In 1939, the year that World War II began, he became a French citizen. By then, his work was widely admired, particularly by Solomon R. Guggenheim, who planned to open a museum uh, dedicated to avant-garde art. Kandinsky became known as the patron saint of the Guggenheim. And that's uh, interesting to know because Guggenheim's um, uh, own architectural style is very geometric and curvy. Um, so I could kind of see how he'd dig it. Oh, and that was the end. We don't get to know anything about what happened to Kandinsky after the end. Okay, so I have an ambitious idea for you. And I know some artists have done this. I've seen other painters, um, put my book down. I've seen other painters do this thing where <clears throat> they choose a color and assign it a note or a letter. So you're kind of creating your own alphabet. So let me just, I don't have my markers up here, but okay, that's my bookmark. I'm losing my mind. Okay. Um, so let's say. Oops. Paper in here. So, oh, look at that blue sky. That's nice. <laughs> um, so it, it would probably be easier if you used markers for this, but let's say you wanted to make up your own kind of color alphabet. If you're musical, I'm not even going to try to do this with music notes because I don't know. Um, it's a bug on my screen. I don't know music notes. Um, but let's say you were trying to do um, your own alphabet. So every letter could be a different color. A, B, C. Okay, so let's start with A, B, and C. And let's say A is red. Let's say B is orange. My marker is dying. C is yellow. Okay, so you could make up your own sort of alphabet and do color block paintings, and it would essentially spell something out. You know, you can think of all the different colors, especially if you have Crayola crayons, and they have a million different color names, um, but you could also think of all the in-between colors, like teal or seafoam green, or just stick with, like, the basics. Um, so I challenge you to come up with either your own translation of letters into colors or shapes. They could even be shapes, like maybe D is a triangle. So anytime you see a triangle, you know that's the letter D, all right? So can you come up with your own um, coded vocabulary to turn into a painting? That would be really cool something I've been wanting to do for a lesson in class. So I'd be curious to see what you guys come up on your own without my um, 
what this way sort of <laughs> approach that might might end up happening. So well, let's see what you do and maybe it'll guide me in some lesson planning for next year. All right. Um, and then make a composition with it. Give it a name like Harmony and COVID. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Love you. See you soon.